Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. All right, welcome all you cool ghouls and friendly fiends to the House of the Unusual podcast. I'm your host, Joe Pavlansky, and with me as always is the maestro of mail order mysteries, Eddie Guevara. Today, the house opens its doors to two good friends of the show and fan favorites, Dave Haversat from the 1878 Press Company and horror magician, Chuck Caputo. Gentlemen, how's it going out there? Doing just great, All Joe. right, pretty good. Everybody's <laughs> good. Everybody's good. So uh, let's start today, I guess, with Dave and uh, Chuck here. Uh, they got a lot to talk about. Chuck, uh, you wanted to have uh, asked Dave a couple of questions. Since both of you guys are uh, legends of magic, <laughs> kind of. Okay, sure. So go ahead, guys. <laughs> take it away. Okay. Hey, hi, Dave. First of all, it's a pleasure to meet you finally. Uh, you know what? And uh, I see that you're an expert on uh, Houdini, which is fantastic. I was always a big fan of of uh, Harry. And um, uh, you know what? Probably the question that I had for you, Dave, was what do you think about in 1908 when uh, Houdini wrote The Unmasking of the of uh, Robert Houdin. Uh, do you think that this is based based on fact pretty much? I mean, I mean, there is quite a bit of uh, dispute about this. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, Chuck, I, I think at the time, um, you know, Houdini took a lot of criticism for the book and uh, uh-huh. that continued up until, you know, he died in 1926. I don't really uh-huh. put a lot of stock in, you know, the facts with, with the book. I, I feel that Houdini almost had a, I don't know, personal vendetta against the um, Houdini family. Right. And, uh, right. I, I, you know, a lot of people who were confidants of, of Houdini's, including like Frederick Eugene Powell, who was a, a good friend, had even told him at one time that, you know, he thought he got it wrong um, about, you know, Houdini. Okay. But, um the funny thing about that, Chuck, is that that book, Houdini always claimed that that was his first real magic book, meaning, you know, he had mm-hmm. those pitch books that he did early on. Um, but it was like the first book that had like some meat to it, you know, with some history and some facts. And right. I personally like the book, like looking at and reading it and seeing the, um, you know, the illustrations in there and the old broadsides and so forth. But <clears throat> why he would, um, you know, in 1890, he read the autobiography of um, Robert Houdin, and that's mm-hmm. what uh, prompted him to uh, change his name from Eric Weiss to uh, Harry Houdini. And then only, right. you know, uh, a decade or so later that he's criticizing the, the you know, so <laughs> it, it, it was kind of a strange book, but um, it, it's still an interesting and mm-hmm. good read, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Is it is it true, Dave? Uh, from what I've read in different places, that what really made him mad, Houdini was at some point um, uh, uh, prior to writing the book, he had he had met well, well he tried to meet a uh, Robert Houdin's widow, but then she uh, she basically refused to see him. So that kind of made him upset, made him mad. Is that is that w- one of the major factors why he did turn on turn on Robert Houdin? Do you think? I mean, that's that's what I read. I don't know. Yeah, I've I've read the same thing. You know, he's he contacted the family and uh mm-hmm. he didn't really get the time of day and um yeah <laughs> and, you know and then that prompted him to um to do the book but you know what's funny about that is later on in his career when he was doing the uh the larger show um which mm-hmm. was called the three in one show where he did his escapes he did magic and then he did the expose on the spiritualism um he included right. the rear rear bear Houdin, uh crystal coin casket you know which houdin did oh okay and uh right he he boasts about it now he did not own rabir houdin's he owned a replica of it but he uh he gives credit to houdin during the show and talks about him so maybe it was uh you know kind of an about face and he changed his his idea his criticism later you know Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm You had mentioned, Dave, that Houdini debunked uh, spiritualists. Uh, yeah, that was that was uh, that's probably the biggest thing that I do really admire Houdini about. I mean, there were some 
there was some corrupt stuff going on back in the early 1900s, I guess, 1910s, 19, uh, all, all through the early uh, turn of the century. I mean, uh, there's a book that I have, which I'm sure you probably have 10 copies. It's uh, Julian Proskauer's Spook Crooks. And it gives, you know, like a breakdown of some of the some of the techniques that, uh, you know, that were used. Holy smokes. I mean, people were built out of their, out of their money and they were uh, preyed upon during their sadness. You, you know what I mean? And uh, so that's the one thing I do really admire about Houdini. He went after a lot of these uh, people. Yeah, he did. And he went before Congress. And at the time, he even wrote a, a plea to the president. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, that was his crusade. Um, and I think, you know, the the spiritualism uh, aspect, it, it kind of went in waves so to speak because it was right. you know being demonstrated in the 18 late 1870s 1880s and there was debunking then and some mm -hmm. old old research i found um you know oscar teal was houdini's uh ghost rider uh and and he was also a, a big uh big wig in the society of american magicians and right. um you know he he had also he was by trade he was an architect but before that he was a full-time magician in his younger days mm -hmm. and i found that in the 1880s um he was doing the same thing that houdini would later do with the debunking okay. so i think what happened is around that time when houdini's mother passed away um mm -hmm. and he was Houdini, you know, was defrauded, uh, so to speak, because he was looking for a message and a sign from his mother. And he wanted to believe, like so many people do, that he, there was contact right. being made. And I think he felt that he was slighted. You know, here he is, the master magician, an entertainer, and he was taken advantage of while he was grieving. And of course, that set right, him off right. with his personality. But I think with Oscar Teal, have had had experience in the past with this. I think he kind of mm -hmm. was also uh, pushing Houdini, like we've got to do something about this. This has been going on too long, and mm -hmm. Houdini took it to the next level. Right, right. Well, that's well, that's really fascinating stuff. Uh, the other question I had the uh, the only time I heard Houdini's voice was on the on the infamous wax reel, you know, and, uh, that was, that was kind of cool. And, uh, I'm not sure exactly what year that goes back to, but that was kind of neat. Uh, can you, uh, can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, Dave? I'm not as familiar with that, um, recording, you know, I know it's in the public domain I've heard it. Um, and I think the original is owned by David Copperfield. Uh, it was just, uh, you know, in the early stages where they were, they were capturing um, voice and so forth and him being a celebrity, mm -hmm. you know, he was able to, he was able to uh, do that recording. And I, I believe there's, um, there's others that were reported to be out there, but they've been lost to time, you know, of him speaking, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate, yeah. but yeah. Well, yeah. Those, yeah the, oh, go ahead, Danny. No, I was going to mention a little thing about that. The uh, date of the reel is, I believe it was October 29th, 1914 in Flatbush, New York. Um, oh, cool. What happened was, is apparently one of the famous guys who, uh, and the reason I'm saying this, Dave, is because I've been doing a lot of looking into that particular reel and, and recording because uh, I wanted to, you know, make a frame I was working on and I needed to, to work with that. So what happened is, is um, Melbourne, does that sound familiar, Dave, the name? Melbourne? Um, the collector. Oh, whatever, Mil magician. Milborn. Milborn. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Milborn. He found it among some old Houdini stuff. I forget where it was, somewhere in the Bronx. And they found six wax reels. Uh, there's another guy who owns one of uh, like seven and a half minutes of actual recording. So what they did is, is in 1970, they got together in New York City. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in East Orange, New Jersey. And for the first time, they actually heard Houdini speak after at that time must have been like 40-something years since the time of his death, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. And so the actual recording was heard <clears throat> for the first time in East um, East Orange, New Jersey. I think it was Melbourne and somebody else there. But yes, David Copperfield owns the six original uh, recordings. Now, what I did with that is I actually got the recording from the public domain archives and I've sent it out to somebody on, on Fiverr, you know, where you get so they can clean it up for me. I think the guy's charging me like some eighty dollars or something like that, but it's it's gonna be like where it's gonna be crispy clear. Ooh, um, that would be cool. Yeah, so that's actually you know, <clears throat> since you mentioned the recording, that's the only reason I know any history of it is because I actually spent uh, last night, um, you know, doing research on it. Uh, Dave, one question I have for you, real quick, and then you guys can continue. Um, there was a lady who was speaking. I forgot her name, but um. I think she's still alive. Is she still alive today that actually was with Houdini when he did the water torture chamber? No. I think she was. No, no, no one is living from that, that time period. That was probably either, um, that was probably like Dorothy Young. I think it was something, yeah, it was something because they said on uh, the movie, she's the last remaining person. She says, yeah, we used to wait, but she's really like old at the time, but I don't know when they did that movie. So maybe she was. Uh, so Dorothy Young, and who's Dorothy Young, by the way? Well, she was an assistant. Um, she did the. Uh, she was part of a trick called the Radio Girl, and um, she lived. She worked. She yeah. She was an assistant. She lived to be, you know, well over a hundred years old, and she lived in okay, New Jersey. Okay, so then they, yeah, that's the one that was talking. I, I like I said, I don't know where, but she said they did say she's like, but she was an assistant to Houdini then. Yeah, she was. Yep, she okay, was. So that's, that's what they meant with the last living relative. And, okay, go ahead, guys. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. You know what? I was just. I was just curious about some of the some of the uh, you know the 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 facts on Houdini. And since we got Dave here, I I just wanted to ask a few things. Um, uh, his his uh, grave site was uh, vandalized. Uh, Dave, is that correct? Is this? Is this in, in, in Appleton, Wisconsin, or is it the one – there's one in New York, I believe, too, isn't there? Yeah, the one in New York, he's he's not um, – he's not – you know, his body is not in Appleton. He's in he's okay. in New York. And many years okay. ago, the bust that was uh, on top of the grave site was stolen. And uh, okay. that was discovered uh, – it was damaged, and it was discovered – I mean, time has gone by fast, maybe a decade ago, but it had been gone for many mm -hmm. years. It was found in someone's closet. Some guy had stolen it. And um, <laughs> holy smokes. Yeah. Wow. And unfortunately, over the years, there was vandalism. People were trying to take pieces and parts um, from it, um, yeah. which is unfortunate. But there was uh, the museum in Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, that's uh, ran mm -hmm. by Dick and Dorothy Brooks. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorothy Dietrich, Dick Brooks, uh, they redid uh, a bust and they replaced it and placed that on on top of the. Uh, oh, that's nice. Place that's a good. while back, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's cool. You know, uh, you mentioned the way this this bust turned up in somebody's closet. I tell you, I tell you, when I was a kid, Dave, uh, I'm out here in Pittsburgh. There was a small town near us, and uh, and my dad worked in a factory. When he got paid every couple of weeks, I. Uh, I was probably four or five years old and when driving down to the place to pick up the check right in front of the public library, there was a huge statue of Mercury. I mean, with the wings it was a big copper statue. It actually kind of scared me a little yeah. bit. <laughs> about two years later, about two years later, the statue vanished. I mean, nobody knows what happened to it. About 35 years later, it turned out to be in somebody's attic. Wow. There, there was like a contract. Yeah, there was a contractor. I guess he got his team in there. They unbolted it somehow. That thing must have weighed a ton, but it was found up in his attic. And so the library, from my understanding, said, listen, if you put it back, there'll be no questions asked or whatever. So they did. They, they gave it to the gave it back. But that, wow, that's something, isn't it? The way people <laughs> the way things suddenly disappear. Well, yeah, you know, and, and I could never understand that that mentality, because if you're going to take something, I mean, we hear about people vandalizing uh places uh, even cemeteries you know to get bronze so they can try to melt right. it down or copper whatever um but when you take something like houdini's the the bust or this the thing you're mentioning what's the enjoyment out of it because you can't you know as a collector you can't yeah. share it with anybody 
you know, you got to hide it. You got to keep it in a closet. I mean, what's, what's the sense of doing it just to say you, you have, exactly. it. you know, yeah. I, everything I collect or, you know, I either like to show it off or write about it, to, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know what the mentality is of someone just stealing <laughs> it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. And so, so uh, Houdini founded the Conjurers magazine, right? Yes. Back, uh, back in the early 19, 1905 1906 and that was a uh, that was a competitor of the sphinx magazine back in those days right yeah yeah yep yeah. okay yep okay, cool yeah and then later on yeah, there was another have... conjurer's magazine uh that was uh you know well after houdini died but that was uh, done okay. with uh walter gibson um okay yeah. sure yeah oh, that's fascinating fascinating stuff you know uh uh, the other thing you mentioned was uh, Robert Houdin. I'll tell you what, I've, I followed this guy's career and I, you know, I've, I've read quite a bit about him, I guess about what, 14 years ago, Dave, uh, Christian Fechner from France came out with a two volume set, which I, uh, which I'm sure you have too. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know something from my voice tonight, but I have the, I have the two volume set that he came out with. It's absolutely beautiful. It shows his, his inventions in one book and it tells his life story in uh, the other. It's uh, absolutely fascinating. It is, and it's a it's really a work of art. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece, and of course, uh, Christian Fechner um, had a very large collection, and uh, mm -hmm. really being over in France, he was able to obtain a lot of the the surviving pieces that Robert Houdin had. Um, wow! And uh, a number of those things are in David Copperfield's collection, mm -hmm. and. Um, mm -hmm. 2014 i discovered uh where that chris where houdin's crystal casket had gone uh similar to what i mentioned about houdini performing it houdini yeah. had a replica that was made by a french magic dealer named um charles mm -hmm. devere and mm -hmm. uh the one i located had gone from we could trace it back to a gentleman named George Milliers, who was um, oh sure the early sure that's the film the guy film guy that's the yeah yeah wow yeah. he did some great stuff I remember holy he was way way ahead of his time oh I, yeah I remember seeing some of the, yeah he was some great stuff special effects back then that he did but what happened is you know he took over the H Robert Houdin theater after Houdin died and it started going dis mm -hmm. disrepair so I was able to track down that casket. Uh, that coin casket oh. which is beautiful i could send you a wow. picture of it and i that currently is in my in my collection i have oh you have wow that's have cool that wow so i've done a <clears throat> lot of research on uh on houdin you know over the over the years oh yeah. cool wow yeah some of his inventions they were absolutely amazing the uh, the acrobat uh, Antonio Diablo. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable how he would swing up and hang by his feet. Yet, I mean, it's it's just unreal. And uh, uh, the uh, the pastry cook and you know was it was amazing. And uh, I don't know, he was he was something else. And it was all watch work. You know, electronics weren't used at that point. You know, and um, you know, uh, I, you know, uh, when I'm growing, when I grew up in Pittsburgh here, I became friends with a with a legendary magician. His act was all electronic, or predominantly electronic. Del Ray, sure. are you familiar with? Yep. Okay, he was a good friend of mine, and he's the guy that got me into electronic magic. We were fortunate enough. I was fortunate enough to do a, a, a show with him on the on the same uh, same stage at about 1985, 1986. Uh, very very nice man. Very nice man. He was kind enough to show me backstage some of his close up effects. You know, the the, the fireman that climbed the ladder, sure. Suicide Sam. He was, a, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah. Well, but his yeah, act man, was I, always yeah. really revered and people, you know, loved him. And he was another gentleman at the time that was ahead of his time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he was using garage doors open, uh, garage yeah. door openers <laughs> back in the 50s. Nobody knew what the heck was going on, you know. But yeah, you know what, uh, Robert Houdin, uh, you know what, I've always been a, a great admirer of, of of him as well. And and the two volume books are great, like you said. I mean, they are a work of art. They're absolutely beautiful. I think it was about you know, 14, 14 years ago they came out. Somewhere yeah, that, sound, that sounds right. Yeah, before, of course, uh, Christian Fechner was, you know, relatively a young man when, when you know, he had passed away, but uh, he left his mark on magic. And of course, he was a 
a film guy too. You know, he was in the the, the mm-hmm. film business, and that's probably part of the reason why uh, he followed maybe the footsteps of pioneers like George Milliers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I was going to bring in some information. <clears throat> I had looked earlier because I, like I said. It says here on July 1st, 1970, almost 56 years after Houdini made the recordings, Christopher and a few of his colleagues played the cylinders on an early Edison phonograph at the Thomas Edison National Historical Park in West Orange, New Jersey. Wow. I said East Orange before. And the uh, it says here also that the record... Um, the two versions from the uh, cylinders, illusionist David Copperfield is the current owner of all six cylinders. Author Moses, Houdini historian and collector, owns almost seven and a half minutes worth of the original water torture cell recordings. Wow. Who's Arthur Moses, uh, David? Arthur lives down in uh, Texas, and he's been a collector for many years of Houdini. Yeah, he collects really anything on Houdini that it comes out, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, period stuff from Houdini's time or it's current merchandise. Uh, he has a very large and impressive collection. Now, does he, has he ever let anybody hear the full seven and a half minutes of that recording or you don't know it? Cause I don't think there, there's only like uh, one and a half minutes or I don't know of the entire thing. And there've been a couple of sites that have cleaned it up a little, some are not. Um, but, um, do you know, if they you know, I really don't know if the full, I, I couldn't answer that if the full seven minutes, uh, have ever been, uh, you know, uh, public, uh, knowledge, so to speak. I'm, I'm not certain on that. Uh, he may, you know, there may be little bits and pieces like you mentioned, but I, I couldn't answer it if the full seven minutes have ever been made available. Um, Arthur also has some other things like the slides that, uh, that's a slide set when Houdini would do a presentation on the, the expose of spiritualism where he would show, uh, it was like a presentation, a lecture. There's a number of those sets out there, not a lot, but, uh, they're glass, like glass lantern slides. And, um, he's got an original set of those as well. So, uh, as I said, he's got an impressive collection on Houdini. Wow, that's cool. It's great that this stuff survives. That's the main thing, you know. Um, Absolutely. There's yeah. really the film back then. I mean, we see Houdini in the movies, but um, even to find a, a photograph of Houdini on stage, there's really not mm-hmm. many. You know, I could think of like one where it shows his props and uh, besides the uh, the one you see of the water torture cell where he's there with his assistants. But I mean, a full stage setting with everything set up Mm -hmm. on the stage you know there's that that kind of thing just doesn't survive there's like one one image i know that's really clear that you can see um Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i was gonna say uh when you're saying dorothy young was the lady i was speaking of and the film that they did called the greatest uh houdini was filmed in 1999 so uh, of course she was a (laughs) That's 21 years, 22 years ago. So she probably passed away. Oh, now, yeah. I think I, yeah. I met her once because she lived literally two miles away from the SS Adams factory. And I oh, wow. and, and I had wow. met her and she was um, very uh, nice woman, talkative, and she uh, had great recall. You know, she she didn't have any problems with her her memory or, or anything. But um mm-hmm. She was really an actress, you know, and she did a lot on Broadway. I remember her telling me about that. And she had left um, a fortune to, I want to say, I, I don't want to say incorrectly, but I, I think it was like a university or something to do with um, an endowment. And she left millions and millions of dollars. She was a very successful woman, businesswoman. And really? uh, she left oh. a lot of money um, for good causes. But she I would say she mm-hmm. died either around 2010 or 2011. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, she was uh, she was up there in age, but really with it. 
I'm surprised that she didn't have any Houdini originals. I mean, having worked with him was very surprising. Well, she did. She would have probably would have been given away years before, you know. Let me ask you a question, though. Uh, when How old was she when she used to work with him uh, in her teens? Yeah, she had to probably be, uh, oh, 18, 19, 20 years old. Mm-hmm. That's that is very interesting because <laughs> in the movie when I watched it, she didn't look that old at all, which is surprising. Um, you know, it kind of reminded me there was a similar uh situation a while back. Uh, where I was watching a film, oh, I was watching all YouTube videos, and in 1960 something, 1950 something, they had a guy on the show who was in his 80s who had been in the Ford's theater when they shot um April wow. Lincoln. Yep. And, he th- and he said that he saw John Smith Booth jump <laughs> over and he thought that you know he didn't know what was happening but <laughs> John was a nice man <laughs> but this was an actual living wow. person that was on television talking about it I was I was really fascinated isn't that something that is yeah, amazing yeah <laughs> it is when you see the it's like the same thing even though Titanic you know was well after uh, Lincoln, but even, uh, you know, there's no survivors of that any longer. Yeah. But uh, when you would see the old record, the old film uh, documentaries with people who survived that in 1912, mm-hmm. it's fascinating. You know, it's it's so great that they were able to get these interviews and, and capture for the for the sake of history. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, one one um, question I want to ask, as you guys have been talking, uh, uh, Chuck, when you started Horror Magic, right, you uh, said uh, you had recently, I don't know if I mentioned that to David, but you had known one of the original people who did Chill a Theater, or the guy who actually started yeah, Chill abso- Theater. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Yeah. yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was Bill the- Cordill out here in Pittsburgh. He's a, he was a great guy. And uh, you worked with him? Yeah, as well? I did. I actually did a couple magic things, and uh, he was there uh, doing something with Chiller Theater. Yep. Uh, well, Dave, what we're talking is the original Chiller Theater from the seventies that you were watching the television, and I guess that's where the convention okay. got its name yep. from. You know. <laughs> yeah. So he, um, Chuck, apparently had known and met the guy, and he did an unboxing, uh, which I put up in my channel a couple of days ago. And he shows, you know, like autographed photographs that he took with the guy. What, what's the name again? Bill? Uh, Bill Cardill. Now, have you, what What other things, have you guys ever came across each other in Magic? Oh, I've come across, you know, uh, Chuck's name before, but I don't believe we ever had spoken on the on the phone or corresponded by email. Not, not that I know of. No. What about you, Charlie? You know what, Eddie? Like I told you before, unfortunately, I'm really bad with names. I don't know why, but <laughs> they don't stick to me for some reason. You know, I'm. You know, when, when I when I look at somebody, for some reason, I'll never forget a face. I mean, I could look at somebody, I won't see them for ten years, and I'll recognize them. But names, I'm bad with, so I don't. I don't recall Dave, to be honest with you, because for the simple fact that I'm bad with names. I mean, uh, when I do shows, I have to look at the contract of the person that hired me, I have to actually look at it, you know, uh, prior, prior to saying goodbye to the person. So I don't, so I don't say the wrong name uh, <laughs> for some reason, that part of my brain does not click. I don't know why. Uh, Joe, you got any questions, my friend? No, I'm just kind of like in awe, just listening to all this information. Cause you know, like I, I've said in the past, I'm not, I'm kind of new into the the realm of magic and, and stage magic and all that. So I'm, I'm still absorbing, you know, all this information and still kind of just sitting here learning. So it's, it's nice to hear these two, you know, legends of the, uh, of the magic world, you know, talk history and talk different stuff because it's, it's pretty captivating to me. So I'm just kind of letting them go on and trying not to interrupt so they could keep, you know, feeding me information. Well, (laughs) I I guess we have now some time and uh, we'll discuss uh, something that's very interesting. I've been talking to Dave, Harvard, Sad, and Chuck about, and and I also mentioned to you, Joe, when we were saying, uh, we were talking about probably in the next coming few months uh, to try to get together in Pittsburgh uh, next to Chuck's house and um, do an actual live online magic 
show, a magic convention kind of. And that is something that I, I've been working with and trying to figure out the easiest possible way. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, thinking uh, me and Dave were supposed to appear in Chiller Theater. We were going to go to the convention and I had a table set up uh, for the Acme House novelty products that we put together. And apparently what happened with that is that they canceled. Now, in the process, I had blown up, which is funny, a Houdini water torture poster. Uh, that it's huge. It's approximately uh, 70, 72 inches tall by uh, 50 inches wide. It's a huge poster. And I had also had a nice display done of, you know, handcuffs and some photographs of the water torture chamber. And that's why I was adding the chip. It's like a memory chip that you pass in front and you would hear Houdini actually talking about the actual chamber. Um, the situation is that it's obviously now not going to be used for Chiller because Chiller's not going to be there, you know? <laughs> so we were talking about that, Chuck, and and, um, and the idea would be a, ph a phenomenal idea if we could uh, together, and I was going to email maybe Chiller itself to see if it would be possible to get, you know, the mailing list or something that we could use because it would be a large audience and I think it would definitely be for all those magic greats out there would be oh, phenomenal. Would be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like I had been talking and, and Dave, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware, but Dave does have a couple of companies under his pocket. One of them is Presco. What, what is it called? P &L? Uh, Petrie Lewis, uh, old company. Petrie Lewis. I'm yeah. P&L Magic. Um, of course, Xanadu. You also have, and you also have Presco. Yeah. Correct? That's, that's my book publishing. And then uh, the latest one I added, was a uh, old business started in the late twenties called Silk King Studios Rice Silks, which oh, cool. uh, supplied wow. all the the classic silk uh, silks to magicians over the years. Oh man, that brings back that brings back memories, Dave. The uh, SKS silks I got quite a few of them in my <laughs> in my magic collection. Yeah, they're they're gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. Wow. Yeah, they they really are, and. Um, and it, I was very happy to uh, to get it. it just kind of came into my lap, so to speak. Wow. Um, uh, Harold Rice, you know, who Harold founded Rice. Silk King yeah. Studios, was uh, yeah, a professor. Um, but before that, he he uh, started the company in like the late 1920s, 1929. Mm -hmm. And he was getting uh, this beautiful Japanese silk and all the artwork was his, you know, with the imperial dragons and oh, gorgeous, the butterflies and the six foot silks and six foot silks. Yeah. yeah. I have his, I have his books also, uh, uh, Dave, his, uh, the, the encyclopedia of rice silks. Wonderful have, books. Think, yes. Yeah. There's, I, I think three thick volumes. And if I'm not mistaken, Mark Trimble put out the fourth years later, maybe about yes. 20 years ago. Right. Okay. Yep. Yep. He did. And, um, Basically, what happened with that is, you know, uh, Harold passed away in the late 80s and his wife, Thelma, took over the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the daughter, when she retired from her job, she took over the business in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And then she called me um, sometime last year and said, um, what do you think about adding that to the list of your magic companies? And I said, well, sure. I mean, it's an iconic name. Wow. And the cool. amazing thing is the stock that I have mm -hmm. is the stock. If you buy a silk from me now, um, it's a good chance that silk is from the 1960s. Isn't that wild? So there's still that that type of an inventory that's left. Not of everything, um, mm -hmm. but it's nice to carry on the name because it's historical. Oh, absolutely! And you mentioned PNL. PNL was one of the greatest, greatest magic uh, manufacturers that you know that ever was. I, I I still use to this day, Dave. The uh, is it the candle, the candle, candlestick through the top hat, where it's it, it's yeah. it's a right it, it's a rice mechanism uh, type of thing, and the and and the uh, the glass that you put inside the top hat will actually penetrate uh, up from the candlestick into the glass, and it's a it's a it's a uh, sand it's a mechanism cooler. type. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, it's a same yeah. mechanism. Yep. And that thing yeah. goes back at least 50 years and it still works great. It's a wonderful effect. Well, it's even older than that. That piece now is probably, I don't think PL made that since 
probably 1955. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's still working. The thing with P and L is it had, um, a number of owners when the founder, you know, the whole thing with P and L that's a whole nother, that could be a whole nother topic. It may bore some people, but the gentleman who founded it was John Petrie, but before John Petrie founded P and L him, uh, you know, he, he, along with another guy named AC Gilbert, um, Sure. You know, from New Haven, A.C. Gilbert was a Yale student. John Petrie was a young man. And, you know, A.C. Gilbert went on to find, found Misto Magic and the Rector Set and have one sure. of the largest toy companies in the world. But at one time, they were both partners in a company called Misto Magic. Oh, sure. And what happened was they broke they I... broke off and uh, John Petrie went on to do P&L, which was you know, a much smaller business because it just catered towards magicians. And AC Gilbert went on to, you know, as I said, come out with such inventions as the erector set. And right. then he made his own, like the Misto Magic and all the chemical craft. And so uh, both of them were partners. And I said they broke off. And John Petrie specialized in making magic for all the top magicians, along with, uh, you know, amateur and professional magicians. Hmm. And when he died, his son took it over. And when his son died in the early sixties, the son's wife um, kept it going until about 1968. And that's when Abbott's bought P and L. Oh, I didn't know Abbott's had one time bought them. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they did very little with the company. You know, they, uh, they basically just made change bags Mm -hmm, the famous mm -hmm. change bags and uh they subsequently sold it to two gentlemen and then it transferred to another gentleman and then went to another person mm -hmm, and when mm -hmm. i acquired it in 2014 um i looked at the company what was left the tools and the dies mm -hmm. and said to myself what would people still want to buy mm -hmm. and you know the things that people still use uh, they don't use vanishing alarm clocks or, you know, the putting out like the P&L firecracker trick where the firecracker right. disappears in the tube. That would be couldn't mm -hmm. perform that too many places <laughs> anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. So I do cups and balls and the load of bowls mm -hmm. and uh, put out a nice set of brass Chinese sticks. Hey, that's so I great. try to keep the company going, you know, oh, in, in name. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I'm so glad you're keeping that alive, man. That is fantastic, Dave. You know, uh, that's why, Chuck, when uh, when you had told me about that you have specialized in horror magic most of your life, um, I decided to reach out to Dave because one of the things I was thinking with the product line we are creating on the magic, it could be carried and produced by PNL. It will be PNL, the Chuck Caputo horror line or Chuck Caputo magic line. Um, that would be something of, uh, of, you know, to go forward from here. Uh, it would be a nice, uh, uh, I guess, add on to the house of the unusual. I think you, um, no, I'm just saying, just telling you guys that. Yeah, that would be, go that ahead. would be fantastic. You, you mentioned Abbott's, you mentioned Abbott's, uh, <laughs> Dave, I had a chance, my wife and I, two summers ago in 2019, prior to COVID, we went to, the Abbott's get together first time ever. I, you know, I've never been there and it was fantastic. It was about six days straight of straight magic. You know, uh, it's, it's a small town, as you know, everything's within walking distance. Uh, you know, so, so, so you go to the high school for one evening for the show. Uh, you go to the grade school for something else. Uh, and you go to Abbott's for more lectures. I mean, it was fantastic. It was really, really cool. Yeah, that's one of the last like type of conventions I think in the country that's mm -hmm. like that, you know, where it has that type of feel where the the town basically survives on, you know, magic manufacturing in that convention every year. Oh, and, it was uh, so it was so yeah. much fun. I'm so glad I finally had a chance to go, where, Dave, because you know what I've been I've been working nonstop doing shows for almost 37 years. It was ridiculous. Wow. wow. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so we said, listen, we better just slow down try and take it easy and have some fun, you know, and, and thank goodness we did. Yeah. It was a blast. It really was. I hope that they can keep that going, you know, because, uh, 
you always hear different things about different magic retailers, uh, the mm-hmm. old time places, including Abbott's. And I hope they're able to survive and I certainly you know, continue hope so. to put that convention on. Oh, absolutely. And throughout the years, I've been to the Magi Fest out in, uh, out in Columbus, Ohio, which oh, is yeah. pretty cool. Too. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, now, back when I went, it was run by Mac Magic, you know, uh, Jimmy King. And I think they sold everything, uh, the, uh, the actual uh the actual convention rights anyway to uh, to uh, vanishing ink i'm pretty sure joshua J and those guys out there yep. i think run it run it now but that was a that was a cool thing too that was really neat that went on for years i have a lot of the original uf grant magic in in my collection you know uh he was a brilliant inventor too the things he came up with i mean they were built with simple simple types of uh you know uh, uh woods and so forth they were spray painted but they were really really neat i mean he was he was very clever uh uf grant he really yeah i would say he's probably one of the top uh, you know top 10 inventors of of magic because he turned out a lot of great products mm-hmm. and he made the material affordable for people yeah he did yeah he you did know? i mean that was like that was like masonite i think a lot of stuff was made out of you know just uh basic basic inexpensive stuff but uh, and he uh, silk screened everything really cool, and uh, the ideas behind it, the methods, you know, were really really brilliant. I mean, he was he was a thinker. Somewhere I I read Dave when he died, they have cigar boxes full of ideas that he didn't even have a chance to build, you know, wow. because yeah, he would just jot these ideas down, and they had I don't know how many cigar boxes, but it was tons of notes of things that he planned on doing, but he never had the chance, you know. Yeah. You guys are talking UF about Grant, yep. correct? Yep. Yeah, UF Grant, I think most of the mail order uh, companies of the 1970 comic book mail order sold mm-hmm. UF Grant stuff. And the House of a Thousand Mysteries, um, it was probably the largest. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know? uh, yeah, yeah, he was very prolific. The big lost in the, the big lost in. And let me ask you a question when you guys are talking about UF Grant and all that. Um, with the coming of me you know not mail orders precisely but i'm saying with the coming of all the magic and stuff wasn't uf grant the one that made those plans that there's a, a bunch of books that go for a couple hundred dollars um are are they from uf grant that make all the levitation and like how to build your own props or am i wrong in saying that that's the company that put it out or uh, I'm, not, he, I'm, he, I'm not sure yeah. Yeah, he may have. He, yeah, well, I'm yeah, trying it, to think of the book you're talking about, though. You know, he he had booklets that he put out, but th- there's other people that did that, like uh, Burling Hall, mm-hmm. um, a guy named Burling Hall, put out a lot of plans, and he put mm-hmm. out an illusion book. Uh, again, you have Grant was so he 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 had a lot of paper stuff, but I'm more familiar with the props. Mm-hmm. You know, his inventions with the props. Yeah. Um. See, I, I'm trying to think which of the company now. It's Abbott's did too. Company. You know, Ab, Abbott's put, put out Eddie books. and Illusion. You know, uh, book the plans. You know, plans Absolutely. and things. Yeah. Yeah. It it might be. You know what? I think it's Abbott. Where exactly is that? Where you say that there's a, a Abbott's puts up all this info. All I mean, this show you guys. Are That's in about Michigan. Convention. Does this happen? Yeah, it's I've in never Colin, it Michigan. Before. Well. You know, a- Abbott's has a website. If you you type in Abbott's, you know, Colon, Michigan. I mean, or Abbott's Magic, you'll it will pop up, and um, you- you'll see all the information. You know, because they really push their convention. It's usually oh. in August, right, Chuck? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I-, I have a little a little collage I put together. It was uh, August fifth through the eighth on the. Uh, when we went a couple of years ago. So yeah, it's the be- beginning of August. Now last year's was canceled because of COVID. So hopefully this year will still be a go, you know, but I, I, but I don't have plans on going this year, but I mean, we did go a couple of years ago and it was fantastic. I and mean, it was really amazing. Yeah. The, I've never heard of it. That's why I'm kind of shocked. I would have, <laughs> that's probably something. I yeah. You really, you really should that. check it out. And, and uh, you know what they've getting back to UF grant somewhere I read, that he came up with so many ideas, you know, that when Abbott started carrying some of, some of his effect, uh, uh, that they didn't even want to use his name because people wouldn't believe 
that one person could even be this inventive. <laughs> so they came yeah. up with, this, yeah, they came up with the name Zella. Am I correct? It said like Zella card rise, Zella this, Zella. that was, yeah, yeah. that was UF Grant, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. He was just a, he was just a brainstorm. I mean, he just kept coming out with stuff. It was amazing. No, it, re it really is. And, um, you know, you could still, I mean, not that they're still inventing new things. Of course, uh, you have Grant turned into Mac Magic, and mm -hmm. um, Mac's still in business. And of course, they sell a lot of other people's products. Um, right. To me, it's of course it's it's not the same as the original, but that's also because back when you have Grant was alive, the materials they used were were different too. You know, the type of um, the Absolutely. stencils or or just the the metal the metal work was different. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm glad to see that they're they're still hanging on. Yeah. Now, Mister Magic, when you mentioned that Dave earlier, I have a Mister Magic yep. uh, set. What happened to that company? It just disappeared. No one owns it today. Um, I think somebody you know took over the uh, the rights to uh, AC Gilbert and you know and the company, but. I don't think they turn out. I haven't seen a Misto Magic set, you know, and they used to put out all those other sets too, the chem chemistry sets and like I said, the oh, electric yeah. sets and yep. I, I actually got a uh, a Misto Magic set for Christmas from my wife. It's the um it's uh has the the guy with the top hat on the uh yeah. the left hand side and then like the dancing Ooh. devils or demons around the cauldron on on the right. I mean, it's it's a beautiful set. Oh, Everything, yeah. 100 percent complete. And what boxes, you know, has seen its its better days and all that. But the artwork on the front and, and inside is just oh, amazing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a really nice set. I think from I think wow. it was 34 yeah. or 36, like that, 1934, 36. They but yeah, so it's, many a, it's a beautiful that set. Got young people interested in magic. Uh, countless amount of people, you know. We're buying, uh, we're buying their sets, and um, yeah, they, yeah. There's a, there's another one I I, I want to to look for. I think it's from 1909, and it has a um, um, kind of like a demon on the front coming out of some smoke oh, from a, yeah. a lamp, and like a kid reading a book. I mean, it's the artwork on it is just, it, it's fantastic. I, I'm, you know, buying it more for the almost the artwork than anything but even when i you know looking inside at the the pamphlets and and uh you know some of the gadgets and all that it's just it's a really cool set i mean they they produce some high quality stuff there and i mean that's you know yeah you're getting yeah. Almost yeah. 90 like you said old. that's some high quality high quality apparatus there i mean if you compare it to the stuff that's knocked off today these little cheap plastic things holy smokes i mean there's like yeah that's a you know, I, I remember getting some sets, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, some of them, you know, everything's <laughs> plastic and cheap. And, you know, I got the set from the 30s and, you know, pretty much everything's metal in there. And if it is plastic, it's a, you know, right. it's a durable plastic. I mean, even the paper stuff in there was a, a durable paper. And, you know, you don't find stuff like that that anymore. I guess everything's made to be, <laughs> you know, broken or destroyed so you could buy more. But, you know, there, there was some craftsmanship at Back yeah, in, well, you know, the 30s it was and all a whole different, it. a whole different era. And um, the Misto sets, as I said, uh, when when it was owned by the two gentlemen with Petrie and with AC Gilbert, it was a different Misto company. So you, if you see like really early Misto sets where there's, um, oh, I I'm trying to think of some of the tricks in there, but everything's kind of made out of wood and the tricks are in like little round boxes set in and it has like a devil and it has a kid reading a book and rays are shooting mm -hmm. out from the book. That's, right. that's the really early sets. That's before the, the Gilbert Misto sets. Then those were, those are harder to find because they didn't make as many. The company was. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, the yeah. kid he got like Ray shooting yeah. out of the book, and there's a demon coming out of the smoke. Yeah, I I've been looking for a while for one of those, and it that's impossible. I mean, I haven't seen one on eBay or 
or anything, but uh, the, early, the the later ones in the 30s, you know, you could find those. They pop up from from time to time, and they're you know pretty decently priced, you know, affordable. Wow. But yeah, the 1909 set or yeah. anything around that time, I, I haven't seen any. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> Joe, I <laughs> out of the closet. Eddie probably got no, 30 no, no, of them. I, I actually, <laughs> I actually bought yeah. one of those many, many years ago. I, I, I have it somewhere. It was falling apart. The front cover is like all the four flaps or like one of them is totally ripped off. And it's in there. It's not in great condition. I have no idea where it might be right now as we speak. But I know I have it because here's the reason I bought that is because back in the 70s when I was growing up as a kid, there was, uh, you know, how we went to school and we got those book things that you can order oh, books yeah. in class. Yeah. Club. I sent away for a thing called uh, Kovets, I think it's C-O-V-E-T-S, Magician. And Mr. K- Mr. Kovets Magician or something, it shows a little kid reading a book with a flashlight and kind of like a, a ghost popping from the book o- on top of him. And, it, you know, it's a really beautiful cover. In fact, I was able to get the book again because I lost it in a fire back in 1995 where I lost a lot of part of good part of my collection. And I bought that Misto set kind of because of that thing. When I was looking for the book, I came across and I, I'll tell you what, Dave, I bought that. If I don't know if you ever went with me in the PAL uh, flea mm-hmm. market in uh, Wayne, New Jersey. Some guy had it there. I think he sold it to me for like $45. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a whole lot. But... um that's you know that, that that was something interesting. Well, one set I was able to get two other sets at a very reasonable price. In fact, I think it was under forty bucks each. The FAO Schwartz yes. oh, they had cool. a magic set and a trick set. What's really sad is the box it came in is so blah, you know, blank. It's one is blue, one is red. It says FAO Schwartz. It's not a box that you would say, "Wow, I got to have the box." <laughs> yeah, the box looks so awesome. Uh, the set is complete. You know, you know why that is, is because box. at FAO Schwartz, all that stuff was demonstrated live. You know, they had like mm-hmm. a counter there where the kids would see it being demonstrated. So if they said, yeah, I want that, you know, you just hand them the box where the other stuff was on a shelf. You know, you had to have the graphics. And I mean, that would be right. my thought of why they just had a. I know it's exactly what you're talking about, Eddie. It's very it's very bland. I think it just says, you know. FAO Schwartz magic set, and that's it. <laughs> FAO Schwartz, and and I and I actually got them from the same collector, and they're in perfect condition. Yeah, wow. Everything's in it, um, and I was like really in shock <laughs> that it wasn't better. But um, Misto Magic, I do have I think two or three sets of those, and then I have one. Um, this one that's a magician. I don't know if it's Misto or. Um, What's that other company, Dave, that you said that they used to? They became very popular, and they used to uh, make magic. Tenyo. Tenyo yeah, Tenyo came out later with that. Um, I, I say Misto dominated the the industry for many, many years with their magic sets. Adams had an, a set early on, too, like in the 30s. Those are kind of very rare to find the Adams sets. But when Adams, um, when Misto started to kind of, died down or AC Gilbert died and it went to another company. Uh, when Adam started to put out the sets in the late fifties, early sixties, they kind of dominated the market for many years. And then Marshall Brodeen came with TV magic. Oh, and, sure. You know, there's yeah. a lot of history of magic sets being very influential on young people, um, you know, to get them started in a career in magic or as a hobby of magic. Uh, the one thing I'll just say about Adams is I had the connection there. What Adams did, which was interesting, is the old sets used to just be the box, and you had the parts. You had like a cardboard, like say the Misto sets. You had like a cardboard thing in there, and you would put the tricks in there. And of course, they'd roll around, or you know, they if you shook them up, everything would be all messed up. Mm-hmm. But what um, Sam Adams' son uh joe came up with is he was looking one day at a box of candy and he said you know look at how all these candies have its place and uh, if you look on the top of the lid it tells you what candies are where so what he did is he took the tricks 
and he laid them all out and he went to a plastic injection molder. And that's where they came up with the idea of making that plastic insert that sits into the box and then all the tricks snap into place. That was oh, a cool. an Adams thing that, of course, is still done today, you know, where that plastic thing is inside and it's the same as like the candies in a in a candy box. Nice. So just a little, you know, a little tidbit of I, I only knew that by looking through old records and seeing him coming up with the idea and talking to people about that, you know, how much it would cost to put that in there as opposed to having this cardboard thing where nothing really fits or gets bent and broken. Now that plastic yeah. thing too, you know, those things could fall apart as well, but that was a, a, a little tidbit of information on the old Adam sets. I, from the old Adam set, when I first met Paul free from, um, uh, Robbins, D. what's Robbins. the name of the company, Dave <laughs> Robbins, right? D Robbins. I purchased uh -huh. way back in 1989. They had, um, this SS Adams magic set. If I'm correct, it was a small box. It says Adams magic, amazing magic set, something like that. I think yep. it had a rabbit in a hat with something like that. It was really, really. And then I also bought, uh, from uh, Franco American novelties. I bought about 10, 12 magic sets. It was a white box, uh, shrink wrapped, and it, they all had the 101 magic tricks that you were always having Johnson Smith yep. and a lot of the mail order companies selling. Um, I do have a couple of SS Adam sets from when I had my magic shop, you know, just the old magic one. I've sold over the years, maybe three or four of them. Um, I do, but, I, but like I'm saying, I, I do have a couple of those old magic sets. Now, I have at least, and I rebought a bunch because to me, growing up in the 70s, what, uh, you know, entered my mind, not entered, but what I saw the most that made the biggest impression in my mind were the uh, yeah. uh, TV oh. magic sets oh, sure. with Marshall Bourdain. <laughs> so I, I have, oh, I have about 10 of those. <laughs> Every single one they made. Because, you know, when you're a kid, no. Chuck, remember, we couldn't afford the $4.95 right. right. most sets cost. And, you know, when Marshall Bourdain would show the TV yeah. mystery cards that go blank and the TV magic cards, oh, they yeah. were like, wow, man, those, those cards are different. And if I'm correct, Dave, what was the name of that major uh, car company that was located, I think, in Europe or something that made all those uh, magic cards for people? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not we certain if they made, the they made one, they made the, the land automatic deck for us. Uh, mm -hmm. which was the secret mark deck they made that for adams but the name of the company was yeah that name and the name of that Gally company too. was called carta monday and oh yeah carta monday yeah okay okay i used to i used mm -hmm. to buy the haunted deck from them i used to buy from them dave because it was a regular deck of cards and then it was wrapped with a with a paper around it and it said haunted deck i used to buy from them the uh Espengali. Yep deck and then i used to buy from um uh morris costumes i would buy these Bengali. um now i don't know if i got that from robbins or morris uh, uh you know it was like seven how to make uh tricks and i used to sell it as a set it was the book with the cards you know and they were both and you know basically the magic tv ma now you know come to think of it i don't know if tv magic sets were uh made by the same company but that company was pretty decent you know that yeah good prices yeah when you um I, you know? I did when i mentioned carta monday the interesting thing is not long ago you know carta monday uh european company they bought out u.s playing cards u.s playing cards is no longer an american-owned company and they they now own um you know the cincinnati-based um u.s playing cards bicycle back and all that which is uh, remarkable because that was a, such a, such an old old uh, company. Oh yeah, wow. Hey guys, I hate to hate to uh, interrupt uh, this great conversation, uh, but we got about a minute and a half left here, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up. And uh, want to thank uh, uh, both of our guests, Dave and Chuck. That was a fascinating discussion on on the history of magic and, and collectibles and. We would definitely have to do this again because I'm sure that there's there's so much more to talk about. And I, I learned, you know, so much tonight and I, I hope our audience did out there as well. So thank you both for, for coming on and, 
and giving us all this information and having, you know, a great conversation about it. Um, for everybody out there listening, thanks for stopping by. Check us out on your favorite podcast platform. Um, subscribe to our channel. You know, give us a, a good review if you like the show. Head over to YouTube on House of the Unusual. We have some great videos up there. Uh, Eddie's always putting up some videos of, of Chuck doing some magic. And check those out. Subscribe to the channel. Like the videos. And head over to houseoftheunusual.com where we have a free mailing list. We have a free forum site where you could interact with some like-minded people and, and you know, just have a good time. Hey, so thanks for, thank thanks for having Eddie, me. Eddie, Chuck, Call. Dave, thank you guys for being you, Dave. Great by. walking down Magic uh, Lane. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, likewise. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. And Chuck. Absolutely. We'll, we'll definitely all, all have to get together again because I'm sure that there's so much more to discuss. So, Okay, All thank right, you. Guys, have a good thank night. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks okay, a lot. Bye-bye now, guys. Bye.